Okay, guys. Uh, Mr. Rooley graciously agreed to let me torture him with a quick superheat subcooling lecture. And this is just a couple rule of thumbs when it comes to charging units that you need to know. One rule of thumb, domestic units for the class, we're talking about refrigeration. You should never charge above 65 degrees, okay? That does not apply to refrigeration units. There's different ways. And you should use superheat. Actually, I won't make superheat red. Superheat and subcooling. I want you to think about where superheat occurs and subcooling occurs. Superheat occurs where the refrigerant heats up in temperature, goes up in temperature. Where does the refrigerant heat up in temperature? Or where does it absorb heat? Evaporate. It happens in the evaporator. So the way that looks, very quickly, you got an A coil or you got a refrigeration coil, whatever kind of coil you got, it hits the metering device coming from the liquid line. So this is our liquid line. Then it drops in pressure greatly and comes in as a liquid. About halfway or a little past halfway through that coil, it absorbs enough heat to boil off. Once it starts boiling off and turning into a gas, then it comes out on your suction line. Right, same thing here, metering device, liquid line, it comes in the top, it's liquid, about halfway through, a little more than halfway through, it turns to gas, okay? So, what is superheat? When it goes into the coil, it picks up latent heat energy. It's not boiling, it's liquid. When it gets to this point, it's called saturated. That's your saturated temperature. It can no longer pick up any more heat energy before it changes from a liquid to a gas. What superheat measures is once it changes from a liquid to a gas and comes out on the suction line, superheat is the temperature difference from the state change to the line. How much sensible heat did it gain after it changed states. That's what superheat is. That's what superheat is. So, for example, if it changed states, let's say, at 32 degrees, but it came out of your coil at 38 degrees, what's your superheat? Six degrees. Your superheat is six degrees. Now, oftentimes you'll get confused because guys will measure their suction line all the way back at the compressor. So that where they'll the measure clamp, it right here. Is that where the clamp come in? Yep. So they're going to put their clamp on the compressor and measure. You know why it's easier? Their gauges are hooked up there. They're reading the pressure on their suction line, which is telling you what the pressure is coming out of the coil. And they're reading their temperature. It's going to pick up a few degrees maybe along the run. You want your most accurate superheat reading? Read your temperature right when it comes out of the coil on the suction line. But for our most purposes, you're close enough if you read it at the compressor, right? So here's what superheat tells you. High superheat equals undercharged. Okay, or bad TXP. Got it? Because that TXP is supposed to close, open, and close to create what it feeds into the coil. If it floods that coil, it can't turn it all from liquid to gas, and you're not going to have accurate superheat. Likewise, if it starves that coil, it's not going to have accurate superheat. See what I mean? So what's it supposed to be? So superheat should be RTFM. Read the flipping manual. Yes. Read the flipping manual. 
there are rules of thumb I can give you. Refrigeration is different than uh, residential or light commercial. So in refrigeration, your superheat usually would be anywhere from three to six, depending on the equipment and the temperatures. Um, in residential, it should be six or light commercial, six to 12. But I have seen highly efficient variable units where neither one of these apply. So if you want a rule of thumb, what should it be? RTFM. 12 be on the, on the actual unit, that sticker? Uh, it will actually be in the manual itself, not on the sticker. Okay, a lot of units have subcooling stickers or, or grass slides on them, but they don't have rarely superheat, but they'll mention it in the specs in the engineering or the installation main. Okay, but they'll tell you like uh, I've heard guys say two to three, two to six, three to six on stuff like that. It really matters. Do you have a medium temp, low temp, very low temp unit? It changes. You know what I mean? Is a variable speed evaporator super high efficient? Most are. RTFM. Roll of thumb, three to six, six to twelve. Refrigeration, three to six. Um, HVAC or HVAC, six to twelve. Got it? So, before I erase this, just to be sure, you got your little manifold here. You got your suction gauge, your uh, head pressure gauge. When you hook up to your suction line, you're going to read a pressure. You're going to convert that pressure using a PT chart to a saturation temperature. It'll tell you on the gauge what the temperature is. You know what that's telling you? That's telling you the saturation temperature in your coil when it starts changing to a gas. That's what the saturation is. It cannot absorb any more energy before it changes to a gas. So tell me the temperature and the pressure? Well, the pressure will tell you on your manifold. You'll take that manifold pressure and convert it to saturation temperature. Using that? Hmm? Using that? No, use the gauge. The gauge will tell you, fine. Grab that manifold right there. Say on your suction side, you have 100 PSI. Convert that 100 PSI to temperature. Uh, around 30. That's telling you inside your coil, right there where it's saturated, is 30 degrees. You see what I mean? Let me see that. Yep, so this one is uh, pretty basic. I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but you have the PSI in black, the temperature in red. If we go to 100 and convert that to saturation temperature, we're at 30 degrees on this coil. Now that obviously varies based on what type of refrigerant you have. That's why you have a PT chart. But if you're using the correct gauges, it'll convert it for you. It'll say R404A. This one is R410A. So, so right there, you see what I mean? Um, digital gauges, you can pick the refrigerant and it'll do the calculation automatically. Make sense? So you measure at the compressor, you get your pressure, you convert it to saturation temperature, and then you measure the pressure of your line. The temperature of your line minus the saturation temperature equals your superheat. So let's say that again. Line temp minus saturation temp equals superheat. Okay, so you're hooked up to the section line. Mm -hmm. and That's how you get your saturation temperature. All right. Then you go down and you put the temperature clamp right there. Most people will put it right here. If you want it more accurate, you put it coming right out of the coil. Uh, will that give you a pressure or will it give you a temperature? That'll give you a temperature. Okay. So you need two temperatures to calculate your superheat. You need your saturation temperature right in the middle of the coil. Can you look in the middle of the coil and take a temperature? No. No. How do you get it? 
Manifold. Manifold, you convert your pressure to temperature, right? right? So that's your first one. In this case, it's 32 degrees, let's say. Then you measure your line. Let's say your line this time is 40 degrees. What is your superheat equal? Eight. Eight degrees. You got it. Not bad, right? No, I thought it'd be way harder. Mm, not, not that bad at all. Let's do subcoin very quickly. Okay, I think I'm going to stick with red because it's easier to see. Subcoin is the exact opposite of superheat. So instead of an evaporator coil, you have a condenser coil outside, right? Um, let's say you have a compressor, you have your suction line coming in, it compresses it, and your discharge line coming out. So it goes from low pressure vapor to high pressure vapor, thereby high temperature vapor, right? It's going to raise it up, say, 120 degrees. Make the math easy. 120 degrees. And it's going to steal thermal energy from that refrigerant by blowing air across the coil. And then that air is blown out the top, and then it comes out of the bottom of the coil as your liquid line. Right? Okay. Let's say it comes out at 90 degrees. Okay. So we're going to hook up to our service valve on our liquid line. Same thing, this gauge. Let's say you're running a head pressure. Um, a head pressure of 300. What is your temperature? On the blue. On the head pressure side. Uh, 300, a little bit under 100. Uh, be more accurate than that. Count the ticks. I got a PT chart right in front of me here. I can't write it down. Uh, should be about 96. Yep, about 96 degrees. What's that saying? So it enters in at 120 degrees. Okay. It comes in as a gas. By the time it gets to about 96 degrees, it changes to a liquid. That is your saturation temperature, 96 degrees. Then, right here, it changes 96 degrees. Then it comes out of the liquid line at 90. Your saturation is the exact opposite here. Sat temp, saturation temperature minus line temp of your uh, liquid line. equals subcoin. You see how it's the exact opposite? So saturation temp, what is it? 96. 96 minus, what's our line temperature? 90. 90. Six. Our subcoin equals six degrees. Okay? Here's a couple rule of thumb in HVAC. Let me start there. Um, 20 degrees anything is too high. Okay? 20 degrees superheat equals overcharged. 20 degrees subcooling. I'm sorry. I got that. Is that superheat equals undercharged? So as you add refrigerant to it, your superheat goes down. 20 degrees subcooling means overcharged. As you add refrigerant to a system, your subcooling goes up. They're inverse of each other, so, right? So should your uh, superheat and your subcool, should it match? No, no, RTFM. <laughs> yeah. A good rule of thumb, though, you never want to be this high. The other rule of thumb, I'll say it again, 6 to 12. Superheat, about 8 to 14. 
subcoin is ideal. Refrigeration much lower, two to six, and then subcoin you might get anywhere from four to twelve. So it's different. It's a little bit different depending on your lows because how hard is it to keep an insulated refrigerator box um, cool? How much thermal energy do you have to remove out of an insulated uh, a, a cooler, basically? Not a, whole lot. Not a whole lot. What about your house? A lot. So you need a bigger temperature difference in that coil in your house than you do in an insulated box. You see what I'm saying? So that's not the only thing that can affect it, though. You know what else can affect it? Airflow, airflow across these coils or water flow across these coils. So for example, if your condenser fan motor goes out, what happens to your head pressure? Probably goes up. Goes up. If your evaporator fan goes out in AC mode, what happens to your suction pressure? Go down. Go down. Very good. So here's a good rule of thumb. I like to, this is, there's other things, but a rule of thumb. Remember, rule of thumbs are stupid. They were, they, they're really nice guys. They can help you out. But if there's anything different, they're dumb. They won't tell you. So rule of thumb, high plus high equals low refrigerant. Let me tell you what that means. High suction temperature and a high suction pressure equals low refrigerant. Now, high plus low equals no airflow. Think about this, high suction temperature, I'm sorry, I got those backwards. Low, low equal airflow. So low suction temperature, low suction pressure, that usually means your filters completely stopped up, your evaporator fan stopped uh, running, something happened to where your coil is getting extremely cold on the inside. And it, the refrigerant is getting so cold, it's feeding back on the suction line that your pressure is dropping, right? You'll see low, low on your gauges before you see the indoor coil freeze up like an igloo. Does that make sense? Um, a bad TXV valve, will often show up by having um, low suction pressure. You show up and your suction pressure is plummeting, even sucking down into a vacuum, right? How do you know it's not low refrigerant? It'll do the same thing, right? Be low suction pressure with low refrigerant. Um, I got these backwards. So it's high temperature, low pressure. I got that backwards. I meant to say low, low. So high temp, low. So let's care, let's go for the beginning. If your temperature high is high on the suction line and your pressure is low, that's telling you you don't have enough refrigerant to get a cold enough coil. You're starving your coil. You got it? If you're low, low, that means you don't have airflow because you're sending enough refrigerant in, but you're not getting enough heat energy out of that coil, so it's just getting colder and colder and colder. Okay? Now, if you have low suction pressure, one thing you might get confused by is, hey, I've got low refrigerant. Not necessarily. If you have low suction pressure and high subcooling, or if you have high superheat and high subcooling both, that's impossible unless bad TXV valve. Okay? 
to have high subcoin and high superheat, it's saying that you're getting plenty of refrigerant into your coil, but you have plenty of refrigerant. I mean, you're getting not enough refrigerant into your evaporator coil, but you got way enough refrigerant in your condenser coil. Uh, those two things should not happen. You see what I mean? Yeah. Unless your TXB valve starving your coil. It's clamping down and starving your coil. Does that make sense? So that's a little mini lesson about superheat and subcooling. Uh, Zach and I are going to do it in the lab, but whenever you guys get a chance at home to get in the lab and start doing your subcooling, remember you have a troubleshooting guide in your team's files that will tell you exactly how to calculate these. You don't have to remember it, but basically superheat is uh, liquid line temperature minus saturation temperature in the evaporator. Um, Subcooling is um, temperature coming out of the coil uh, minus the temperature of the liquid line. I'm sorry. I said liquid line. Superheated suction line temperature. I've seen the L, not liquid line. Suction line temperature minus saturation temperature. This is subcoin is saturation temperature minus the liquid line temperature. Don't have to memorize that. It's in your troubleshooting guide. All right. You do need to know that subcooling is for the condenser, superheats for the evaporator. It makes sense if you know evaporator absorbs heat. So it heats up the refrigerant, superheat. A condenser cools down the refrigerant, subcools. And then the other thing to remember is that it superheats it or subcools it past its saturation temperature, which approximately happens in the middle of the coil where they change states. Make sense? All right.